welcome. Like I said, you're welcome to turn your video on at any time and participate in this conversation. It's very informal. Emily and I are here to kind of host the conversation and she and I have a lot of different talking points we'll be discussing. But if you have a particular question or you want to jump in with a thought or perspective, just know that you are more than welcome to do that at any time. And then, like I said, if you're more comfortable just talking and chatting with people, side conversations are perfectly fine in the chat box. Um, so the, the purpose of these case study sessions is really to talk about person-centered care through the lens of interdisciplinary collaboration. And if you haven't heard me get on my soapbox already, I'll just briefly talk about how, you know, we're, we're all trained in different colleges and different programs, even across OT, SLP, and PT. We don't have a lot of interaction in our training programs. And then we're kind of dumped into these workplaces and expected to have a really high level of collaboration um, and communication and understanding in those workplace settings and healthcare facilities or in schools. Um, but we don't really get to have conversations about what that looks like. And so that's what these case study sessions are for, is to just kind of have these conversations and talk about ideas for how we can best collaborate with the focus on providing care that is centered around the person and what their values are and what they need out of the healthcare system. And today's case study is kind of that classic case of somebody with dysphagia who's given a certain recommendation by a speech pathologist and she does not want to follow those recommendations. So I know you guys have all read the case study, but I'm just going to read it out loud for anyone who's watching this later so everybody knows what we're talking about. Um, so this case study is about Anju. Anju is a 62-year-old female um, who recovering from anterior spinal surgery. And per the MBSS report, she is aspirating on thin liquids. Various strategies were trialed. The only successful strategy was small sips, which reduced the risk, though it didn't completely resolve it. The evaluating SLP did try nectar thick liquids, which did resolve the risk of aspiration. The report concluded that she should be on a softer diet with nectar thick liquids. She is unhappy with this and does not want to drink thickened liquids, and she is dehydrated and at risk for a UTI. So to have this conversation with me today, I invited Emily McKee, who is a registered dietitian, um, and Emily and I used to work at the same facility together, and so I have deep respect for Emily. She was always my go-to person, um, especially working with cases where um, dysphagia was involved and we were wanting to make sure that you know, those people were getting the nutrition and hydration that they needed. So welcome, Emily. Thank you for being here. Do you want to just tell everybody a little you. bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so my name is Emily, as Megan said, and uh, we, we work here in Missoula, Montana. I've been working in uh, skilled nursing facilities for about 25 years now. Um, I previously had some experience working in acute care and hospitals, uh, worked a little bit in community nutrition as well, but primarily I've been in skilled nursing um, and so have interacted with many, many SLPs um, in that process and find that uh, the relationship between dietitians and SLPs is really important. And so Whenever we get a new SLP in our facility, I, uh, I like to get to know them, get their contact information, um, help them realize that they can contact me anytime. I, I just think that that interdisciplinary um, communication connection is so, so important um, in terms of getting our residents the nutrition that they need and as safely as possible. So Megan and I did a lot of working together when she was uh, working at the facility and um, subsequently I'm working with other SLPs because she's not there any longer, but uh, definitely very important relationship. So I was happy to participate in, uh, in this session today. Yeah, I don't remember when I first started working there, you were one of the first people that came up, you were so warm, welcoming, inviting. And then we communicated a lot through text. And I knew that I could like at any time pop into your office and ask you a quick question and kind of brainstorm and collaborate on different things, different people that we were working with. 
Um, so when you are looking at this case study, what are some of the thoughts that are immediately kind of going through your mind as far as Anju and her um, dislike of thickened liquids? Such a very, very common problem. Um, weighing the risk of somebody becoming dehydrated, getting a UTI, um, having setback in their recovery, potentially having other, um, you know, problems crop up because of those issues. Um, well, looking at obviously the risk of aspiration, um, you know, typically when I have a resident who is just adamantly opposed to the thickened liquids, um, SLP encourages, I encourage, other staff encourages, but if they get through a day or so of not drinking much because they really don't like those thickened liquids, then, um, then you know, typically in the facilities where I've been working, it seems like, and I would be curious to hear other people's input on this from other states, but um, SLPs seem particularly liability averse, which I know we all are as a society, but um, there are very few SLPs who are willing to kind of put their necks out and say, okay, this person really is at risk for becoming dehydrated you know, we've worked to try to get them liquids that they like. The dietitians worked with them. I've worked with them. Other staff members have worked with them. Family has talked to them. And still, they're just not drinking enough. Um, and so, um, so, you know, I, I, always, I always like it when SLPs are willing to kind of work, work with the whole person as opposed to just looking at potential liability issues. Obviously, I also as a dietitian and I'm a private contractor, I'm not an employee. So, you know, of course, that's always something that you want to be paying attention to to keep people safe. Um, but I guess maybe I'm just delusional, but um, being sued is never top of my list for how I how I approach cases. You know, I try to look and see what is the, the best thing for that resident weighing yeah. all the issues. Yeah. Okay, as you were talking, sorry if I was yeah. typing at the same time, but I was launching the survey. I don't know if you can see it. So if those of you who are with us, I was just asking, does your facility offer variance forms? And I'm just curious how many facilities do. So far, everybody is saying no, which is oh, fascinating. Wow. Um, yeah, and whenever I bring up variance forms, like it doesn't matter who I'm talking to or what the context is like every single time a variance form comes up as a topic of conversation the next thing that the person says is well it that's something that won't hold up in court <laughs> and I like I started thinking about like where did that that statement come from they were all worried about um these variance forms holding up in court and then I started thinking like have there been court cases where people have literally been sued for getting aspiration pneumonia after signing a variance form? And I couldn't find any. I, I don't know if anyone on here has ever heard of a court case where a patient has sued an SLP after signing a variance form. Never heard of it happening. The only court cases that I found in my research were... Um, people suing, like, you know, surgeon, surgeons or those types of providers um, for causing dysphagia with some kind of surgery or some kind of medical procedure. But I couldn't find any kind of court case that was looking specifically at if a variance form held up in court. And like one thing I'm always thinking of too is if for whatever reason something goes to court, it's usually going to be, you know, the underlying argument is going to be for the patient's choice. And so as long as we are documenting very, very heavily all of the education that we're providing, and if we're providing visual and written education, then you have a documentation of the kinds of education you provided. 
And then you have a variance form that they can sign. And they're saying like, I've been provided with this information about this diagnosis. And then I have been provided with information about what will happen if I do not follow these recommendations. <clears throat> and I've, I'm electing to um, not follow those recommendations anyway. I think that's a, a great option for patients to be able to have. Yeah. And, and um, what we have done at the facility where I work right now, I'll always, we actually don't have a terrific protocol in terms of who's supposed to be contacting uh, family POA if there is one. Um, again, what I've always heard from SLPs is they don't want to be the ones to contact family that, um, again, it just seems like liability just looms over your profession far, far more than it does mine. And maybe it's just me, but other dietitians I've talked to seem, you know, maybe not quite as open to doing this. Right. Yeah, I, but, but so what the one thing I do when I have, um, when I bring it up to a resident, assuming that they're able to, you know, be, you know, cognitively aware enough to know what we're talking about, um, is I always call if there is a POA, I always call that POA and have a discussion with them as well. And I have never, ever had a POA say, no, don't do it. <laughs> you know, they always want their parent, sibling, whoever it is to, you know, to be able to consume what they're able to and what they want to. Right. Um, so, so even if they have concerns, they're still willing to do that. Yeah. Okay. For those of you who are here and said that your facility does not offer variance forms, I would love to hear kind of what your protocol is. Like if something if somebody is given a diagnosis of dysphagia and they are recommended to have a certain diet or liquid and they don't want that, what happens then? And you can feel free to type in the chat. You can tap the reactions button in the little bar and raise your hand so I can see it. You can just turn your camera on and your microphone on, but I'd love to hear um, kind of what yeah, what the policy is, what the procedure is for when people do not want to follow the recommendation. What what other path do they have? I'll speak quickly about what usually happens at my facility. My name's Chelsea and I am in Denver and I am in the acute care setting, but I was in long-term care prior to this. Um, and usually it becomes a conversation involving palliative and hospice. And then that's kind of what covers the bases in terms of the liability concerns. And I, you know, I've been an independent clinician for almost a year. So I think in one or two instances, that hasn't been in the family or patient's wishes to go um, with hospice or comfort care goals. So ultimately the MD or, or whoever the physician is will um, kind of oversee that decision and, and okay the, the, you know, going against what is deemed as medically safe um, given the larger discussion of risk of quality of life and risk of dehydration. And um, so usually if hospice is not um, involved, then it's usually in tandem with the physician to make sure that we honor the patient's wishes and the patient and family wishes. Yeah. Anyone with... Um I guess I'm thinking of situations too, where maybe it's like in this case study with Anju, she's 62, she's young, mm -hmm. this, um, this edema is going to go down probably fairly quickly, but the risk of getting asper aspiration pneumonia is fairly high just because her immune system is probably a little bit beaten up after surgery and um, mm -hmm. there is the presence of aspiration. But in her case, it may not lead to death. It may not lead to, you know, a significant shift in um, 
the duration of her life, it would just be an, another infection that would need to be dealt with. So I'm also curious, Chelsea, if you have thoughts or if others have thoughts about what you do when like maybe the person does not want to follow the recommendations, but it's not quite as dire as we need to get hospice or palliative care involved. Right. And I'll let other people speak to that too, because I'm interested to hear what other people say. Usually we just try and manage it to the best of our ability within the patient's wishes. So if they do not want to be on thickened liquids, which I entirely understand, especially given the greater picture involving risk of dehydration, um, then we'll try and, you know, be really, really careful about a free water protocol and education within the nursing team um, and try and make it just manage that risk of infection as much as possible, essentially. I'm curious too, Chelsea, um, how, how resistant or accepting are the physicians that you had dealt with in acute care to, um, to, to writing that order to allow them, let's just say thin liquids instead of what was recommended? Are they pretty resistant to that or are they agreeable knowing that bases have been covered? I would say that and again, you know, I've only been, I've only had my C's for less than a year, so I don't want to give too much um, anecdotal evidence here, but it seems like it really varies quite a bit from physician to physician. Um, but with a trend towards um, being really open to, um, you know, what the what the patient wants. I mean, they understand the risk of infection, um, but in cert at a certain point, they understand the risk of a lot more infection than, you know, sometimes we do, or sometimes, you know, they just have an idea of kind of all the different parts of the, the patient that we're managing, and usually um, managing the aspiration pneumonia with a free water protocol is something that they're pretty open to, I'd say, but it, it does vary a lot from physician to physician. I'd, I'd be curious to know how many of you out there working in, um, in more long-term or subacute settings, how successful the free water protocol is, because I have found when we've tried to institute that, that it is not very successful because oral care is not done thoroughly enough to decrease the risk. And does anybody out there find that it's really, I mean, with, with patients who, who aren't cognizant enough to be thoroughly, you know, doing mouth care after every, every meal, um, has anybody actually found that to be successful? I love the, the concept, but I just haven't seen it work. Yeah. Yeah, Claire is saying in the text box that that's um, that she's also found that to be the case. It's very challenging, yeah, because mm -hmm. at that Absolutely. point you're you're relying on not only the patient but also multiple caregivers and staff members who may have different ideas of what oral yeah. care is. Like I agree with Jennifer there. I rarely recommend the free water protocol because I know it won't be followed. I mean, I think that's what we found too is that. Um, yeah, it's a shame that yeah. we can't. Yeah. Chelsea says difficult to implement with fidelity, yeah, particularly in long-term yeah. care and acute care. And that's why I'm like, at the end of the day, like, you know, how much can we educate and put in parameters for safety versus just letting people make the decisions that they want to make. Um, okay, so I, I'm going to shift away from the variance form just because there's a lot of other topics we want to get through, but feel free again to keep going with the conversation. I'm still especially curious how people are navigating if you don't have a variance form in place and you have a, a patient like Anju who's not necessarily headed toward hospice or palliative care, what outlet or what options or what pathways do your patients have to be able to make their own choices. Um, but let's talk about how 
SLP documentation impacts dietitians? And I know, Emily, like the first thing that's coming to my mind is um, swallow strategy recommendations. <laughs> you want to talk about that at all? <laughs> <laughs> well, once again, I, you know, I think we can probably link that right back to the success of our free water proto protocol. Um, I think they can be extremely valuable, as all of you out there know, uh, they serve a, a critical purpose. But um, again, in a facility like, you know, like the one that I work in with patients who maybe their eyesight's not so great, maybe their cognition's not where it needs to be, they're sick, they're not feeling well, for them to follow a list of strategies um, is, and some do, certainly some do, um, but I think so many of them just either aren't able to follow or those who really need to have that cueing. Um, one thing we've done where I, at the facility where I'm working is that we have them now printed out on the, the meal tray tickets. And that is by far the most successful um, strategy. And that way people, aides who are in somebody who needs to be helped with feeding, the aides can, can read those swallow strategies and do the queuing. Now, do they always, certainly they don't always, but at least they're there and available. Um, and so even if, you know, even if 50% of the staff is reading them, that's a heck of a lot better than not having them there at all. Um, so yeah, they, they definitely, and, and, and that's where I guess I would, you know, kind of morph into the whole state survey business because that's where our facility kind of goes round and round that if we have those uh, swallow strategies printed on the tray tickets and a state surveyor is in the dining room observing the meal, and they're not seeing a staff member, you know, reminding and cueing, and that resident isn't following those safe swallow strategies. That's where it does become a sticky issue, um, right. I would say. Right. And it's tough because I think a lot of SLPs feel like it's my job. It's my, like, I am here. I'm being paid to, like, write out these recommendations, and then I need staff members to follow through on them. And if they don't, then this patient is at risk. And, but like you're saying, it gets really problematic when those recommendation, recommendations are taken very, very, very literally by state surveyors. And it's like, if they're not, if the staff is not following the recommendation to the T, like if I say, you know, swallow and then five second delay before giving next bite or whatever. Like if there's not exactly five seconds, that could be a tag for the facility. Mm -hmm. And so one thing I've started doing is um, instead of like writing out a very black and white list of recommendations in my evaluation, the wording is very different. And I'll talk about that the patient was provided with education around strategies that may help, including this, that, and the other. And, you know, utilization of these strategies will vary based on, you know, individual needs at the time of that meal, um, cognitive status at the time of that meal, et cetera. But really documenting like we've provided education around this, um, but it will vary based on you know, the day and the time and the setting and all of that. And even with staff too, like these, you know, staff was trained regarding the potential use of these strategies as needed. But then again, I think SLPs feel like that word, like that phrase as needed or as able kind of gives staff like mm -hmm. an out or an excuse to not do it at all. But I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think we can like exist in a world full of lots of gradients of gray <laughs> rather than a black and white world where it's like this entire list of swallow strategies has to be followed every single time to a T. It's like, here's a list of recommendations that may be beneficial given certain circumstances during a meal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd be curious to hear if anybody out there has found um, any successful ways to to implement swallow strategies that you feel really are beneficial and have them followed through with. Um, 
because I'd love, <laughs> I'd love to be able to implement a different system in our facility if we could, something that's more successful. Uh, we're always looking for new ways to do things better. You know, I do think too, just, just facilities that have more staff, it's harder, you know, larger facilities because you do have a lot more staff and more, you know, just people who aren't as familiar with each resident, which makes it that much more challenging. Yeah, does anybody have any, any good solutions that have worked? You know, at one point, too, Emily, we had tried, especially for people who have cognitive impairments, we were doing those laminated trifold mm -hmm. pieces that we would put onto their tray at each meal. And it had like visual instructions for the staff as far as how to feed them safely. Yeah. yeah and of course, the problem with that was that they would get thrown away. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so, very hard to keep track of. Whereas the trade tickets are printed daily. So I do think in that sense, it's much more successful mm -hmm. having them printed on the trade tickets. You know, the other piece of it is, Megan, you were so good at doing um, staff in servicing. But I think even while you were still there, you know, you're, um, you just, because of billing, you weren't able to do the kind of the extra things that you initially had done in terms of in-servicing staff, things like that. Because I think frequent in-servicing really would be ideal, you know, because we, we'd like these strategies to be implemented and followed, um, you know, but we need staff that are aware of what they mean and how important they are too. Yeah. So... Yeah, especially in facilities where there is a pretty significant turnover of CNAs in particular. Mm -hmm. um, I've also seen facilities make like laminated oral care cards and those are placed on the tray as well, like either before meals or after meals, um, just to remind the staff to help them with oral care. Mm -hmm. I think what else I've seen or if any of you have tricks that have worked well. You know, yeah, it seems like maybe some, uh, oh, I was just going to say that, that, you know, to, to use that maybe in, in the residents' rooms that when they're going back from a meal to remind them to, you know, oral care after, you know, don't forget, do your oral care, you know, after every meal would be, you know, for some residents, I think that could be successful, at least uh, that piece of it. But I yeah. do wonder too, with the swallow strategies, if, I mean, I realize it's hard for, for you all as professionals to say, what's the most, what are the most important swallow strategies? But I wonder if, you know, and I, maybe you just can't do this and, you know, your profession, because there's so many important pieces, but if it could be one or two of the most important strategies, I wonder if they would be more apt to be followed. Right. Oh, I totally no. agree. I think we get a little bit too right. Like we've all got, we can like drill them in our sleep, right? Like upright, 90 degrees, fully awake, fully alert, small bites, small mm -hmm. sips, like all these things. Alternate bites and sips, right? <laughs> Double. Yeah. And it's like, Kentuck. it's, I think the harder thing anytime you're trying to communicate something is to simplify the message. Like it's easy to just kind of you know, spit out a whole list of recommendations, but if you can simplify it and make it really, really customized to that one particular person and what their issue is, then I think, yeah, there would be a way higher chance of follow through all around. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a big fan of obviously education handouts, both for the staff and for patients. So if you can create like a folder or a binder where you print out just one page pieces about oral care. Like we have one that talks all about the bacteria, how it gets into the body. You know, there's research showing that that oral bacteria can enter the brain and has implications for the onset of dementia. Just like little tidbits like that can be so powerful to explain the why, like why we're, we're all so passionate about it and why we feel the need to like write a million mm -hmm. recommendations and really push for oral care and swallow strategies. 
Um, but it's like, you can have all of these recommendations blasted out everywhere and you can have list after list and placements all over the place. But if people don't understand why, mm -hmm. then nobody's going to do it. And yeah, state surveyors, going back to state surveyors, that's, that's an interesting line to walk to. I don't know if anyone else has experienced <laughs> state surveyor <laughs> stories, but I know I've met, I met one who was just very, very convinced that a person needed to be on thickened liquids. And it was my professional opinion that they did not need to be. And I think that's another important area where we got to stick to our professional guns and like advocate for mm -hmm. our patients even in the context of state surveyors coming in with mm -hmm. their opinions. Yeah and the state surveyors certainly range in terms of what their what their opinions are and what they're looking at and and you know you might find one who is really going to hone in on the specific recommendations and you're not following them and another one who's looking more holistically and this person is not getting enough to drink because they're not on thin liquids, they're refusing that. So, I mean, that's the other thing. And that's where I think, Megan, you're right. You have to follow what your professional opinion is because, um, because the state surveyors are not always going to be following the same line. So I think it's important that, you know, again, we, we you know, stay with what our professional uh, opinions are and, and stick to that. You know, yeah. and that's really the best thing that we can possibly do. Yeah, and document, 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 and document, document, everything. Document mm -hmm. all the education that you provide, document and keep copies of it, document all the conversations, you know, patient responses, what they have verbalized to you, what they've verbalized that they understand, what staff has verbalized that they understand. Document if you're talking to any kind of caregiver, POA, any kind of ex internal group that's involved in the care of that person, always document everything that you are providing as far as education and insight and evaluation and all that. Yeah. Um, I think that this case in particular of Anju for this fictional case study also makes me think about women in the healthcare system. And I think it wouldn't take very long to have a conversation with a patient like this to realize that maybe she's feeling a little bit like she's gotten pulled into our healthcare system and a lot of her independence and autonomy and right of choice has been taken away from her. And I find often with women in particular that like, if we're making recommendations like thickened liquids, it's kind of sometimes like the straw that breaks the camel's back. It's like, it's like one more thing that gets kind of piled on and one more decision that gets taken away from them. And really the conversation isn't so much about, you know, drinking thickened liquids or not, as it is about respecting and honoring particularly women's choices to make, you know, their, what, what they feel is the best choice for their own bodies. Mm -hmm. And and as I said to you, Megan, and um, when we were having that discussion before this, that I think just self -advo -adv advocacy in general for women tends to be uh, difficult. I don't think women tend to advocate for themselves as much as men do. And that's certainly been my my experience um, working where I work. And I was telling you, uh, Megan worked with my mother, who. Um, I moved from a facility in Florida to the facility where I work in Montana, ended up just being the last two months of her life. But she, when she was in Florida, um, was told that she could not eat. She was NPO and they wanted to put a feeding tube in, which happened. Um, and my mother could express to me and my brother that she wanted to be able to eat but she was not willing to say that to the healthcare professionals. And I, I just see that situation so often. And so I was making phone calls to the facility in Florida saying, where's your variance form? <laughs> you know, I want to sign it. My brother will sign it. You know, where are the POAs? My mother wants this. 
and they would not budge. Absolutely no, she could not eat or drink. So it wasn't until she got to Montana. And by the time she got here, she was too weak to be able to eat or drink. So I, I just, I, I feel that um, that's, it's just really wrong when it comes, when it, you know, when it means the demise of a person because, and granted she was on the tube feeding, so she didn't die from um, not eating or drinking, but uh, for her, it, the, you know, phase of her life where she was to be so fatigued from her illness that she could not, not go back to eating and drinking ever again. I just think there's something wrong with that system where we're so, so fixated on, on getting sued. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's lit- the litigious perspective. And then also it's this traditional medical model. It's like, there's this authoritative healthcare professional provider culture and it's very mm-hmm. much like glorified with TV shows and movies and, you know, like it's, it takes a lot to become any kind of healthcare provider as far as the education and, you know, to get into that tier of professional provider status. But I think somewhere in all of that, we've lost a little bit of this perspective and value for just humanity and for individual person, person centered choice, person centered care. And it does, it becomes like, we don't want to get sued. We know what's best for this person. We're just going to make the decision. And if they're in our care, they're going to have to let go of their independence. They're going to have to let go of any, a lot of the rights that they have as an individual human to become a patient in our care. And I just, I personally do not think we don't, like, you can't have both. You you, you can allow people to make their own decisions and give them really high quality medical care. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Megan. How many of us, you know, really in any of our disciplines, other than talking to and educating the the patients, how many of us really say, you know, how do you feel about this? Is this something you're comfortable following through with? I suspect myself included (laughs) that most of us don't take that extra step, at least not initially, maybe once problems start becoming apparent. But um, yeah, I agree with you. I think, you know, people lose so much of their autonomy when they come into facilities like, you know, a hospital or a nursing home or a skilled nursing facility. And, um, you know, to at least really involve them in the conversation (laughs) seems so very basic. And just that's just not a model that we typically follow. So, all right, yeah. starting tomorrow, I'm changing. I'm going to change <laughs> that aspect. <laughs> well, and I, I mean, I've talked about this before, so sorry if I'm repeating myself to anybody, but I've started, like, rather than walking into a room and saying, like, my name's Megan, I'm with speech therapy, which in and of itself is very confusing. And like, I, you know, I've looked at your chart and it looks like you're having this issue and this is what I'm trained to help you with. And this is kind of the plan. This is what I'm thinking. What do you think? I've completely flipped that. And I've just started walking in and asking people like, what is your current understanding of your health right now? And it's, it's fascinating to hear like people's stories. Cause I'm not the, you know, we're not the first people that they're meeting on this journey And often like within the story that they're telling of their understanding of their health right now, you're getting to hear a lot of the struggles that they've had, maybe some of the medical trauma that they've had. They're not only going to talk about their understanding of the health situation, but they're going to talk about what they're maybe trying to get out of this whole, you know, being part of this healthcare system and what they really want Um, And then the more questions that I can ask, like, what are your hopes and priorities? Like, what do you not want to lose? What's most important to you? What are you willing to sacrifice? What are you not willing to sacrifice? And these are all questions that Dr. Atul Gawande writes about in his book called Being Mortal, Medicine and What Matters in the End. Um, But yeah, I think the more that we can flip it, and ask questions and get really, really, really curious ourselves as to like, what are they really understanding? What are the gaps in their knowledge? Like maybe they've 
heard about aspiration pneumonia, like maybe have, they have this very abstract idea of what that is, what it looks like, what causes it, what it would feel like, you know, the problems that it might cause, but have they ever gotten the chance to like look very specifically at an anatomy physiology drawing or look at like the three pillars of aspiration pneumonia and talk about like, what are the things that we can control in this situation? And what are the things that we cannot control? So maybe we can control, you know, keeping up a healthy immune system status. We can control oral care and making sure that that's provided consistently, but we can't control the presence of aspiration. But even in that context, evidence shows that the risk for developing pneumonia is pretty low. And so I think just having those conversations where we're just like getting really curious, teasing out what they know, what they understand, providing lots of education on our part and spending a lot of our time providing that visual, verbal, written education, and then kind of putting the puzzle pieces together as a team with the patient, rather than strictly looking at it from like, are we going to get sued? What's the risk here as a liability? And how can we best avoid all litigation? (laughs) Okay, Claire, I'm reading. I also like to ask patients to tell me about them in an effort to find out more about their values, cultures, and preferences. Absolutely. Especially that cultural piece. Um, If a patient tells me their family is most important and they only want to get better to play baseball with their grandkids, I can then better provide recommendations in line with their personal goals. Absolutely. Because then the conversation is like, okay, in order to play baseball with your grandkids, you need to be healthy and get out of this facility that nobody wants to be in anyway. And in order to stay healthy and get out of here, this would be the best, you know, recommended pathway to avoid an aspiration infection. Or there's these other pathways, but it might not get you to that baseball game. So absolutely making sure that we can connect points with what's most to them. And, and, you know, what comes to my mind too, is thinking in terms of um, maybe putting in context that is this something that you're recommending they follow forever? Maybe you don't know, but maybe there's hope that, um, you know, they'll get more strength back and they'll be able to safely swallow safe and liquids. So, you know, kind of explaining the whole picture that, you know, this is kind of like taking medicine for a period of time. You know, we're looking at potentially a couple of months and or weeks or whatever it is. And there's a really good chance that your swallow will become safer. And so maybe we do want to really minimize those risks for those few weeks. Um, I mean, you know, I, again, I think you're right. Just looking at that bigger picture of what's going on with them medically, as well as, you know, their, their overall kind of what their history has been and where they want to be going. It's also mm-hmm. important. Yeah. Yeah. But I love that idea of putting a time frame on it, even if it's just like, Hey, let's try this for three days or 24 hours, Mm -hmm. or let's just see where it goes, see how you feel about it. But that's where a recommendation that's just like maybe going to go on forever. That doesn't sound great. And that, and that's where the dietitian can step in as well and be helpful because, um, oh boy, well, we know there are different ways of thickening liquids. If we just want to stick with thickened liquids for the time being, you know, there's the, um, the, powder, I guess it's not really a powder, but it kind of a powder that you can mix in. It kind of makes the liquids granular. Um, There's that liquid that you can use from the pump that makes the liquids much smoother. Um, They're the natural nectar thick liquids, at least in terms of the, um, oh, I'm trying to think what we used to get. Mango juice maybe was one, but those naturally thick, you know, tomato juice sorts of, of liquids. Um, so the, the dietitian can go in and try to individualize, don't give somebody thickened milk if they hate milk, you know, <laughs> I mean, try to figure out what's going to agree with them, um, better and maybe a little bit of lemon squeezed into the thickened water would be helpful. So, I mean, those are some tactics that, that we can really help out with. Um, we have the, we have the thickened uh, magic cup ice cream in, in our facility that, you know, not that ice cream is a huge deal, but on the other hand, if somebody really, really wants their ice cream, it's not quite the same consistency, but they can still get uh, something that's similar at least. 
So there are ways to be working with that. And again, just so important to be talking to the dietitian and explain to them the risks and let them explain to you the risks from their perspective. And that's where I think that collaboration can really be helpful um, in trying to find something that, you know, especially if the SLP says, look, we're really, really trying to focus. Maybe this person's really at risk for, you know, just this period of time while they're recovering from, you know, whatever that the particular acute illness is, if we can get them through that, there's a really good chance we can get them back to the thin liquids. So again, just kind of that teamwork of, you know, SLP dietitian, resident, you know, patients, everybody working together to try to make it make it work if that seems to be the appropriate way to go. Yep. Yeah. And I'm always a fan of smoothies. I know you and I did that a lot about like putting in protein powders for smoothies or what different types of ingredients will maintain that consistency, that thicker consistency, while also providing some of those nutrients and proteins that people need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, we have about 10 minutes left. And I want to use that time to talk about diet texture upgrades and downgrades and that relationship between SLPs and dietitians. And just overall, you know, how to build a successful relationship between SLPs and dietitians. And Emily, do you want to start by talking about what the current policy is at your facility for upgrading and downgrading diet textures? Um, yeah, at our, in our facility, we, the, the dietitians actually recently within the past six months have we had our medical director sign off on um, the dietitian's ability to write um, standing orders in our facility. So we can upgrade and downgrade. Um, what my, what, what our process is that, you know, kind of the, the, um, the procedural part aside or the, the legalized part, you know, the, the, um, the standing order piece aside, I will always downgrade. I've always downgraded diet textures um, if needed. If somebody's struggling to get enough food in, maybe they don't have teeth, maybe they're having trouble chewing, maybe they're having trouble swallowing and the SLP is not right there. And I'll try to get them through the weekend, maybe with a puree diet, that sort of thing. Um, the upgrading of diet textures, I have also always done if it was a chewing issue that caused their diet texture to be downgraded. I will upgrade. Um, and even now that we can actually write these standing orders in the facility, I still will never upgrade a diet texture if an SLP has downgraded because of a swallowing issue. I will always go to the SLP and talk to them. Um, and if, you know, my first, um, the first way I tackle that is that if it's been long enough, usually the SLP wants it to have been several months at least before they've been working with that patient or since they've been working with that patient. Um, if they feel that they can reevaluate that to me, that's always preferable. So if they can reevaluate, say, okay, this person is on a level one, they really would like to have some solid food. I, you know, we discharged them three months ago, but their condition overall has, has somewhat improved. So yeah, it's worth, you know, we can rationalize going ahead and, and evaluating again. That's always my preference. Um, and then if they evaluate and still feel that that person is at risk enough that they warrant a puree diet, a level one diet, um, then that's when we turn to the variance form. So after educating, of course, educating the, the patient on the risks and uh, a POA if they have one. Yeah. Yeah. And I know, and feel free if anybody's here and wants to jump in, if you agree or disagree with that. I know some SLPs would disagree. And when I think about like why there is that disagreement, like why an SLP would feel that it's not okay for a dietitian to downgrade due to a dentition or chewing type issue. From my perspective, that is coming a little bit from a place of scarcity, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. You can all tell me, <laughs> but there's this sense of like, this is my lane. And if anyone enters my lane, 
then I will no longer be relevant, I think is the fear that goes on and why sometimes there's some friction in there. And I guess from my perspective, it's like there, I, maybe there's lanes, but we're all kind of like traveling in and across and between them together all the time as interdisciplinary staff members. And I think it comes down to trust. Like I always trusted you, Emily, to come and talk with us if you felt like there was a deeper swallowing issue going on, or if you just you know wanted some perspective or thoughts on a patient. And I think that's the power of like a really great relationship between SLPs and dietitians is ultimately you're, you're giving the best patient care because a dietitian can manage a situation that's, you know, if there is a chewing problem, then they get an immediate relief and an immediate solution with the dietitian. And then if there's a larger context there, then the SLP can also join the conversation and see what else is going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree, Megan. I think, uh, you know, relationship, 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 because the times when there's been more friction uh, from my perspective with SLPs is when I've not been able to really cultivate the relationship that I like to have yeah. with SLPs in the facility. And I can't, just very, very occasionally, there'll be an SLP who just seems to, I, you know, I don't know what sort of chip they have on their shoulder. I mean, I do get the, obviously there's a difference between disciplines. And I, I think that once, once you get to know each other and can respect each other, both as people and as disciplines, then you don't have one or the other being feeling threatened. Um, and when you haven't developed that relationship, I think it's very easy to have that happen. Um, and you know, the patients are the ones really who suffer from that, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I would never ever try, you know, I always, I always tell residents when I'm in with them that the, you know, the, the speech therapist will be in, they are the swallow specialists, you know, they are the ones who know this stuff and are going to make the recommendations. So um, I'm very clear with, you know, with our, with our clients anyway, and in clear in myself too, that I certainly would never do anything to jeopardize the, the safety. That's to me, that's where you draw the line is where safety comes in. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Again, not, not that ultimately you can't have that uh, variance form signed. That's fine. But, um, you know, certainly just in the immediate, you want to make sure that, that they're as safe as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Dawn says when she was previously working in Sylvie Cute, <clears throat> she would have loved for the dietitian to upgrade and downgrade like that. It seems like appropriate decisions and still staying in the lane. Um, and I, I want to tell a story where that's flipped. And Emily, I told you this, but I got an email from a dietitian who was very concerned about a resource we had in our library at, on Therapy Insights about, um, it was, it was a task that kind of walked people through the carbohydrate counting strategy for mm -hmm. managing diabetes. And for, from my perspective, it was really a cognitive task. It was like, building on what a dietitian would have provide, like the foundation that a dietitian would have provided, but then like going through the process multiple times, breaking it down into smaller steps, breaking down the information into individual pieces. So people with any kind of brain injury or cognitive impairment could understand a fairly complex strategy. Um, but the dietitian who emailed me was concerned that SLPs, this was encouraging therapists to enter into the domain of dietitians. And so again, I think that's where it's like, I would never use that resource without consulting with Emily or another dietitian. I would never be giving advice about how to manage diabetes. But if we're not all talking to each other and we're not all supporting each other, then yeah, the patient absolutely loses out because they're just getting bits of like fragmented pieces from everybody. Whereas when everybody's supporting each other, they're on the same team, they're, you know, advocating for that patient and for their choices and for what they want and need while they're in that system, you're going to get much better holistic healthcare for that person. All right. Did we do it? It's it's one minute till the top of the hour. Thank you, everybody. That was a great conversation. Thank you, Emily.
Yeah, absolutely. You're welcome. My pleasure. Is there anything else that people would like to touch on? Any other fi final comments? Thanks to everyone who participated in the chat. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for being here. Um, you'll get an email with the recording so you can share this with anybody who finds it helpful. And then we're going to keep doing these live case study sessions with a different case study each time and different interdisciplinary hosts to have those conversations together. So thank you everybody and have a good night. <laughs>